They were quiet for a while until... They had just reached Sea Deck when Clover spoke. Hey, what about Thor 2? Everyone else stopped. They all turned to look at Clover. Seven spoke. What about Thor 2? Thor 2 is the only one we didn't... We haven't gone through it, I mean. Yes, that is true. Are you guys okay with that? Not investigating it, I mean? So what? We found door 9. We don't need any of the other doors. What's the point? What's the point in going to door 9? We can't all go through it, can we? Then we should do what we have to do before we go any further. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. The best way to finish it quickly is to do the border pieces first. You know? Or what? You think all seven of us should go to door nine? And then we argue over who stays behind and who gets to go? Do we really want to do that again? Who knows? If we check out door two, maybe we'll find something. Maybe we can find a way to get all of us out. I don't know what might be in there. We might not find anything. But don't you think it'd be better to at least have a look? I mean, am I wrong? Does that sound wrong to you guys? Yeah, you do have a point. The others nodded in agreement. The last time I checked the clock, it was 4.30. It's not like we've got a lot of time, but if we're quick about it, we might have time to take a look. You're right. Let's go take a look at door two. They were back in front of the elevator. The elevator could take them down to door two. After a few minutes of discussion, they decided that Clover, Santa, June, and Seven would go. Four plus three plus six plus seven equals twenty. Two plus two equals... 2 plus 0 equals 2. Alright, let's get going. I'll see you later. Okay, be careful. They climbed into the elevator and Junpei listened to it creak and rattle its way to the bottom deck. Only Junpei, Ace, and Lotus were left. As the elevator rumbled out of sight, Ace spoke. Lotus, would you be so kind as to go with me? Go with you? I didn't think people still talk that way outside of the 1950s. Well, I'm a mother. Would that be a problem for you? Uh, that wasn't what I meant to... I was hoping you would come with me. <laughs> Seriously though, I was kidding. So, where was it you wanted to take me? There's something I wanted to show you. Hey man, what the hell? I'm not important enough? Well, it's not like that. Once I've shown Lotus, I'll show you. Really? Of course. Ace's smile was friendly. Fine, do whatever you want. Thank you. Yeah, <sighs> crashed. Are you coming, Lotus? Fine. It doesn't look like they're going to be back anytime soon. I might as well go see whatever it is you think is so important. Thank you. Well then, shall we go? Ace turned and began to walk. Lotus followed. They disappeared into the hallway on the left. Junpei wasn't sure how long they'd been gone when the elevator suddenly opened. A single person stood there. Clover. She looked at Junpei, then slowly, purposefully, stepped out of the elevator. 
Where's everybody else? What happened? She didn't answer. Instead, her eyes swept the room and then settled on Junpei. Where are Ace and Lotus? Junpei explained what had happened. Oh, then they went over there? Her voice was small and timid. Yeah, I think so. He repeated his earlier question. So where are June and Santa and Seven? Why aren't they with you? You really want to know? There is something wrong with her smile. Y yeah. Okay, sure. Here, let me show you. Clover pulled something out of her pocket and tossed it onto the floor at Junpei's feet. He looked down. On the floor in front of him were three metal rings. Bracelets. Oh my god, oh holy shit! Junpei collapsed. No, no way! This, this has got to be some kind of joke! This, this can't be real! Jinpei's body felt like rubber. His heart felt like a cold lump in his chest and his hands shook uncontrollably. Sweat poured down his face. The three bracelets sat there on the floor before him. He could see the numbers on their faces. Three, seven, and six. Lastly, let us discuss how to remove the bracelets. There are only two ways to do so. One, you escape from this ship. Two, your heart rate reaches zero. In other words, once the bracelet is taken outside the confines of the ship, or detects that its wearer's heartbeat has fallen to zero, it will shut down automatically. But why? Junpei's voice was flat and broken. Clover's response was called. Revenge for my... Revenge for my brother. He was forced into door three and murdered. You need at least three people to open a door. Who were the two that opened that door with him? It could only have been Santa and Seven. Two plus three plus seven equals twelve. One plus two equals three. That's why I killed them. But why? Why did you kill June? Because she tried to protect them. She was in my way. She had to die, too. No, no. Junpei shook his head, trying desperately to wake himself from what had to be a dream. It couldn't be real. It just couldn't. Hey, Junpei? He felt Clover's hand on his shoulder. Her smile was wrong, horribly wrong. Her face looked like a mask made from stretched human skin. The smile that parted her lips did not extend to her eyes. They were dead and empty. The girl in front of him was no longer the clover he had known. Perhaps she was not even human. Let's go. Her hand reached out toward him. Let's get out of here. Let's leave this ship. Wh what the hell are you talking about? T to open a numbered door... Yes, I know. You need at least three people. But as long as we have this... Once again, Clover reached into her pocket and pulled something out. It was another bracelet. Jinpei could see the number on the face. Zero. Zero. You've got something in your pocket. What is it? Oh, this? Um... This is... See? You get it now. If we have the zero bracelet, we can leave. You and I can open door nine with just the two of us. Four plus five plus zero equals nine. See? So let's go. Come on, hurry up! She shoved out her hand again. Junpei looked up at Clover. She had the face of a demon. But there was something else. 
there was a holy light that surrounded her. She was both a fierce god and a benevolent goddess filled with love. Junpei? Her voice was soft. Her eyes weren't empty anymore. They were deep. So deep, Junpei could feel himself falling into them. He felt dizzy. There was something oddly bewitching about her. His mind was beginning to crack and his heart began to melt. Junpei? Before him was her outstretched palm. It looked so soft. Junpei reached out, and the clover's hand closed round his. <coughs> Junpei writhed in agony. He shuddered and twitched, his body spasming as he went into shock. He screamed until his throat was torn and bloody, then screamed more. His cries echoed across the room. Eventually, his movements slowed, then faded. There was no more strength left in Junpei. He could feel his body begin to go numb. He no longer felt pain. He no longer felt anything. Whatever Junpei had been was gone. The last remnants of his mind began to fade. Even as his vision faded to nothingness, he saw Clover. Thanks, Junpei. I'm just gonna borrow this, okay? Her smile was cold. What was left of Junpei's consciousness mind drip What was left of Junpei's conscious mind drifted away? All that was left was a twisted, broken corpse. Okay, let's see what happens if we go into door three. I want to go through door number three. No, you can't. Oh, why? Because it's impossible. If we split ourselves into three and three, then we give up going through door three. Why? The bracelet numbers for the six of us are three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are two combinations that can go through door three. With three people, three, four, five, or six, seven, eight. That's it. Of course, two teams can't go through the same door. I see. That means one team would get left behind. That's right. Anyway, what's the deal? So think it that's the deal, so think it over. You've got two choices, seven or eight. You can't choose three. If you choose three, you're gonna be leaving three people behind to die. So what are you gonna do? Chinpei thought hard. After thinking it over, his conclusion was... Sorry, Santa, but I still want to go through door three. What? That's nuts! You've got to be crazy! Why the hell are you so obsessed with that door? I'm just... I'm just curious about door three, that's all. That doesn't explain shit. I've got a reason. I'd be happy to explain it to you if I'll, you'll just come with me. With that, he began walking toward the door. The others followed. A few of them looked a little suspicious, but Junpei told himself that wouldn't matter. Before long, they arrived at door three. Junpei stopped. I'm curious about the red. Seven, would you mind authenticating for me? Huh? Why? Please just do it. He stared at Junpei for a moment, then grunted and laid his palm heavily on the scanner. Happy? Yeah, thanks. The number seven had been entered into the red. Next is June. Please touch the red, just like seven did. Jumpy, what are you trying to figure out? I think I might have found another way out. Huh? What? Really? That got them excited, just as Junpei had intended. Now please, June. Okay. Seven plus six equals thirteen. One plus three equals four. With those two numbers in the red, Junpei had what he wanted. He casually placed his own hand on the scanner and the third asterisk blinked on. Four plus five is nine. All right. The only people who haven't authenticated now are Santa, Clover, and Lotus. 
So, what's your point? You don't get it. Think about it. What's the sum of your number and Clover's? 12. And what's the digital root of that? 3. Which is Santa's number? By the way, Lotus, what's the number that's currently in the red? 7 plus 6 plus 5 is 9, 18. It would be 9, right? Yes. And what will the digital root be if you add 3 to that? 3, then the door's number. There you go. Hey, wait a minute. What the hell are you up to? I'm not up to anything. I'm just waiting. Waiting for what? I'm waiting for the balance to shift. Santa or Lotus and Clover. Once one of you moves, the others won't have a choice. So I'm waiting. Jinpei laid his hand almost casually on the lever. You son of a bitch, you tricked us! Then all that stuff you were going on about is all bullshit. Bullshit? I don't think so. Didn't I tell you I'd figured out another way to get out of here? This is it. Why the hell would you do something like this? Jinpei glanced at Jun. Jumpy. You did this just so you could go through the same door as Jun. If you'd gone through seven or eight, you wouldn't have been on the same team. You sneaky son of a bitch. Santo was furious. His face was red and flecks of spit flew from his lips as he spoke. Junpei closed his eyes calmly and then opened them again. So, who's it going to be? Santa or Lotus and Clover? Shit. We're going, Clover. Lotus leaped forward. She grabbed Clover by the sleeve and ran for Junpei and the door. Caught by surprise, Santa froze for a moment, then shot forward like a bullet from a gun. Lotus had a head start, but Santa had the advantage in size and speed. Almost immediately, he passed Lotus and Clover. No, wait! Santa did not hesitate. He slammed his hand down on the red. This is insane. This isn't right. He glared at Jinpei, his chest heaving. Yes, well, you may be right. Jinpei's voice was cold, but not without effort. He turned to the red and pulled the lever. With the sound of metal on metal, the door opened. It would only remain so for nine seconds. There was no time to think. Go! Junpei and his three reluctant companions jumped into the door's gaping mouth, one after another. No sooner did they enter than an all-too-familiar noise sounded from their left wrists. The detonators had activated. Junpei looked back only once and saw Lotus and Clover on the other side of the closing door. They stood still, stopped where they had been when Santa breached the red. The defeat and desperation on their faces tore at Junpei's heart. Then the door closed, and they were gone. You son of a bitch, Junpei, this isn't fair! Santa rounded on Junpei, lightning crackling in his eyes and his knuckles white. Do you realize what you just did? You leave them out there, and they can't... Shut it, that's enough! It hadn't been Junpei that spoke, but Seven. We have gotta find the dead, or none of this is gonna matter. The clock was ticking. The dead was their only chance at survival. Unless they could find it, and deactivate the de their detonators, the four of them would be... We got less than a minute left. No time for screwing around, get moving. They scattered and began to scour the room. The deactivation device was nowhere to be found. Corridors stretched out in three directions, but every one was blocked off by a wall of metal. There was only one way out. One other door. There! Seven ran for the door, a rusty iron thing. His large hands grabbed hold of the handle and pulled. The room inside was pitch black, 
They could see nothing beyond the small patch of light that spilled through the doorway. Jinpei stuck his head through the door and looked around the room. Almost immediately, he spotted the blinking red light on the right wall. I found it! The dead's right over here! He stepped into the room and nearly fell down. The floor was slippery. What? He stopped and glanced down at his feet. What was... Hey, what the hell are you doing? Get over here! Get over there! Junpei felt Seven's heavy hand against his back and stumbled across the room. The other three piled in behind him. They all felt immediately that something was wrong. Nothing that could be easily identified, only a sense that something terrible shared the room with them. But there was no time to say so. Quick, get to the dead! In the dark, it was hard to tell where the wall was. All they could see was the tiny red light blinking at them over and over and over. Then finally, suddenly, they were there. They slapped their hands against the dead as they passed. Seven leaned against the wall, gulping air. As his breathing began to return to normal, he glanced at his left wrist and grunted. <laughs> it stopped. It stopped. <laughs> Junpei could hear him laughing in the dark, but could barely make out the larger man's face. What the... <clears throat> ah! The sound of retching came from Santa's direction. What the hell is this smell? This is vile. I'm gonna puke. So desperate had they been in their race to the dead that no one had noticed the horrible smell that pervaded the room. It was a terrible, nauseating stench, like burnt and rotten meat. Adrenaline had drowned it out, but now it rolled over Junpei in waves, forcing itself into his nose with every breath he took. He felt his stomach clench, and bile rose up, rise up in his throat. Let's get the lights on first. There's a switch over here. The light flickered to life. Only seconds later, a piercing scream filled the air. <gasps> Junpei's breath caught in his throat. His heart ceased to beat. Time froze. His mind scrambled to make sense of what he saw before him. What was left of the body sat in a sea of blood. Chunks of flesh torn from the body sat in the blood like tiny islands in a great red sea. A vast, ragged hole had been torn in the torso, and what remained of his intestines filled out of it like fresh spaghetti. Mmm, delicious. Smaller chunks of meat that had splattered against the wall had become stuck there as they dried. That means the spaghetti is ready. No, it doesn't. Globules of yellowish fat had left trails like tiny sluts as gravity pulled them down the wall, even as they tried to. My god, this is descriptive. Looks like an explosion. Yeah, okay. Seven's voice was low and strained. Just like the ninth man. The detonator in his bracelet set off the bomb in his gut. It looked as though the explosion had been quite powerful. His legs were both bent in an odd, unnatural way, and his left arm had split open, exposing the painfully white bone of his ulna. His bracelet lay next to him. It seemed to have hit the wall hard enough to have shattered the display which lay on the ground in pieces. Half of his head had simply collapsed. The blood coating almost made it look like raw pizza dough covered in tomato sauce. His clothes, too, were covered in blood. The burgundy tie, the white shirt, the jacket with the yellow piping, and the gray slacks. They were all familiar to Junpei. Is that Snake? Santa's voice wavered as he spoke, his mouth dry. Oh my god. Finally, Junpei spoke. Why did this happen? No! Suddenly, Jun was screaming, her voice broken. It was an eerie scream, full of insanity and not entirely human. Her whole body shook as she screamed, 
and her hands wove through her hair like desperate snakes clutching and tearing at the strands. Stop it! Stop! He grabbed for her wrist. But as he did, June leaped up and ran toward the exit. Please! Get me out of here! You have to let me out of here! She threw herself against the door and began to pound on it with such force that Junpei was worried she might hurt herself. Why are you doing these horrible things to us? What did we do to deserve this? She screamed again, a desperate, mindless cry. Her fists flailed against the door. Get me out of here! Please, please, just let me out! Junpei couldn't watch anymore. He ran to Jun and wrapped his arm around her, pulling the screaming girl away from the door. No, oh, get off of me! Let me go! Let me go! She scrambled for a moment, her legs skittering across the floor, but her resistance didn't last long. As suddenly as her outburst had begun, it was over. The manic energy disappeared, and her body went limp in Junpei's arms. Jin collapsed toward the floor, and Junpei knelt down with her. He felt drops of something warm and wet. Was she crying? A moment later, she began to sob. Her shoulders shook, and great hot tears rolled down her face like rain. We're gonna be fine. It's gonna be alright, Jun. It's going to be okay, Connie. Her name was a whisper. I'll be here with you, okay? She nodded once. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jumpy. Her trembling voice pulled at Junpei's heart. He stroked her hair gently. His face was so close to her. The scent of her hair was nostalgic. Do you feel better? Yes. I'd like to stay here. For a little while, at least. Jumpy's body is so warm. Several minutes passed before June's tears had dried. He bent down, put his arms under June's, and helped her to her feet. They didn't speak. Neither did Seven or Santa. A person was dead. They had died in that room in a terrible way. Junpei knew there was no way he could make himself forget that. There is no way any of them could forget it, but mourning would do no good. They spread out to search the room, but each felt as if their heart was made of lead. Each of them attempted to turn their minds to something else. Grim reality still hovered over them like a dark cloud, but the harder they focused on the search, the longer they could, perhaps, hold it at bay. Junpei had found a screwdriver during his search and stood with it in, a hand, in hand and stood with it in hand in front of a wall-mounted thermometer. He was struggling to dismantle it, but that apparently simple task was proving difficult. That was when he heard something approach. It was Santa. The other man stepped up next to Junpei and looked with vague curiosity at the thermometer. Hey, Junpei, you know why thermometers only go up to 107 degrees Fahrenheit, or 75 degrees Celsius like this one? No, can't say I ever thought about that. At 107 degrees, the cells in the human body start to die, and the organs begin to shut down. The proteins in your cells start to harden. It's like when you hard boil an egg. Even if you cool it down afterwards, it won't go back to being a raw egg. In other words, it's dead. That's why thermometers don't go past 107 degrees. There's no point. Why had Santa brought that up? Jinpei wondered. Oh yeah? Jinpei hoped Santa would get the message, but... But it's pretty rare for a fever to get that high. Even viruses and stuff don't usually drive the body temperature up to 107. Of course, there are other external things that could... Like what? Well, let's see. Something like getting locked in a sauna. Or getting thrown into an incinerator and burned to death. <laughs> yeah, I guess that would get a little hotter than 107 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Jinpei gave a short, barking laugh. Dang, looks like I can't get this thing down. That just made me think of, like, horror stories where, like, people working at, like, morgues and getting stuck in the, in the furnace. Um, and then having that turn on while they're stuck in there. Sounds awful. It sounds like, I, I, I don't know if it's ever happened, but that sounds like, that's like something that just made me think of that. He sighed and turned around. Santa was staring at the wall, an odd expression on his face. Huh, what's up? Nothing, forget about it. Santa spun around and walked off, away from Junpei. But as Junpei watched him go, he didn't look angry. He looked very, very sad. Almost as if they were switching places, Jun appeared as Santa left. She was holding a long broom. Junpei looked at it, confused, and she shoved it at his chest. Here. What? You're supposed to be the one with the broom, right? So take it. He still had no idea what she was talking about, but clearly it was important. He took the broom. You don't remember the bunnies? Huh? Come on, the bunny hunch. I'm sorry, come on, the bunny hutch at school. You used to always have a broom. I was? Don't you remember? Junpei stared at the broom in his hand. You mean, you don't remember that summer either? She looked very sad. He shook his head. Of course I remember. How could I forget something like that? It was terrible. They were in the sixth grade. Jin Pei and Jun had been assigned to take care of the classroom pets, the rabbits. Their chief duty was to clean the hutches every morning. On the final day of school before summer vacation began, Jun Pei overslept. He rushed to school and found Jun standing in front of the rabbit hutches. No sooner had Jun Pei arrived than Jun began to cry. He had no idea why until he looked behind her, into the rabbit hutch. The first thing he saw was blood. The hutch was filled with the dead bodies of the rabbits. Even after their teachers and friends came to see what the commotion was, Jin couldn't stop crying. I just kept crying and crying until you came over. You held my hand and you looked very serious and you said, Don't cry. I'm going to catch the person who did this. After you told me that, I finally stopped crying. Well, the real fun started after you quit crying. You told me we were going to catch the killer together. <laughs> A smile flickered across her face. Then we decided that we'd ambush them. Yeah, I remember. The school also kept roosters and guinea pigs. Jinpei and Jin had decided the murderer would likely return to finish off the rest of the animals. They would ambush the killer at night. Jinpei and Jin hid behind the hutch at dusk and waited. It was a warm summer night. The quiet sound of crickets whispered through the air. As the sun went down, the stars began to wink at them from the sky. And Jun's, Akane Kurashiki's face, that night was something Jinpei knew he would never forget as long as he lived. But the murderer never showed up. We waited for them all summer vacation, and they never showed up. Yeah, but the animals didn't get attacked either. I think all that work amounted to something, you know? Although, you know, if you think about it, we were probably taking on a lot more than we could handle. What do you mean? Well, come on, we were just kids. If whoever had killed the rabbits had actually showed up, they probably would have had a knife or something. I mean, you must have been pretty worried, right? I... I wasn't worried. Because you were... Because you were there with me. She blushed furiously. You know, no one else wanted to take care of the animals. Clearly embarrassed, she tried desperately to change the subject. I was the only one who asked to do it, at first. Yeah, boys don't really want to bother with taking care of animals, you know? Well, yeah, but you asked to do it after I did, didn't you? Uh, if it 
It wasn't the rabbits. They were going to make me do something else. You know how that school was. I figured it'd be better if I was working with somebody who wasn't too much of a loudmouth, right? Somebody who wasn't going to tell on me if I felt like blowing it off. Really? That's why you volunteered? Yeah, yeah, it is. He nodded quickly and much too earnestly and then quickly looked away as something very important. That hadn't been the reason, of course. He had asked to take care of the rabbit so that he could be near June. But it had been so long ago, he couldn't bring himself to tell her how he'd felt back then. It would be embarrassing. He took a quick breath to clear his head, tossed the broom up, and then snatched it out of the air. Well, we don't really have time to be walking down memory lane like this, you know? We've got to figure out a, a way out of this room, otherwise. Yes. June nodded curtly, then turned and walked away. Junpei turned around and looked at the room, at Snake's body. Chunks of flesh and organs still lay on the floor. The conversation he and Jun had been having scarcely fit their surroundings. But perhaps that was simple human nature. Despite such a situation, or perhaps because of it, the mind turned to the farthest thing from death that it could find. It didn't turn that far. I mean, there was death in that story, too. Still, Junpei couldn't help but feel a twinge of guilt at wanting so desperately to live when Snake lay dead before him. He had to live. He wanted a life again, a life, with June in it. As he stared at the clumps of blackened flesh, all Junpei could think of was how much he wanted to live. The room had several puzzles to solve. Once they had worked through them, Junpei and his companions pushed their way out of the exit like Death himself was chasing them. At the far end of the corridor beyond stood a great iron door. They'd moved a few steps toward the door when Junpei heard the sound of metal on metal. They turned around. Seven was doing something to the door of the shower room. What are you doing, Seven? Well, I figured maybe we might want to come back here sometime. So I stuck the broom in there to keep the door from shutting. All right, let's go. With that, he stood up and began walking down the hallway. He brushed past Junpei and kept going. After a moment, the rest of them followed him. Before long, they found themselves at the large iron door. Santa stepped forward. He grabbed hold of the door and then turned to look back at the rest of them. Ready? I'm going to open it. They nodded. With all his strength, Santa heaved the door open. All four of them leaped through. It took only a moment for them to realize where they were. They had been there only a short time ago. It was the large hospital room filled with countless beds. Lotus and Clover looked up as they entered. Ace was there as well, although he looked as though he had only just woken up. The moment they spotted Junpei, Lotus and Clover headed straight for him. As she neared him, Lotus drew back her hand and slapped him, open-palmed across the face. How could you do this to us? She grabbed Junpei by the front of the shirt and shook him like a doll. Clover didn't touch him, but the hate in her eyes was no less potent. It was Seven who stopped them. Knock it off, we've got bigger shit to worry about right now. His deep voice echoed across the massive room. Lotus glared at Seven, but let Junpei go after one last vicious shake. What? Go have a look. Um, I stuck the screwdriver in the door. That door over there? The one without a number. So long as the screwdriver's there, it can't shut, so you can get it there. Seven also explained how they might find the shower room and how he'd used the room to ensure that door remained open to swell. Then you're saying we can go in there without passing through the numbered door? Yeah, that's about the size of it. What the hell is in there? You'll know when you see it. Lotus and Clover looked at one another for a moment, then nodded and stepped through the door. By then, Ace had made his way to them, moving with the stiff, shuffling steps of someone who has only just awoken from a lengthy slumber. Should I go as well? Seven nodded. Very well. Ace followed Lotus and Clover with his stiff, tired gait.
The squeal of tortured metal made Junpei's teeth curl. It sounded like the noise a ghost would make. No matter how many times he heard it, he never got used to it. Every time it put him on edge. It didn't help that there was a girl nearby who looked far more like a ghost than a living human should. It was Clover. She sat on the edge of the bed, her head drooping listlessly onto her chest. Her eyes were blank and stared across the room at nothing. Her breathing was slow and mechanical. Aside from the rise and fall of her chest, she didn't move. Junpei felt as if even a nudge might cause her to shatter into a thousand pieces. Snake was probably murdered. Chances are he was killed the same way the ninth man was. Seven lowered his voice, likely in an effort to keep Clover from hearing what he had to say. I'll never forgive him. Never, 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 never. I'm going to kill him. Clover let out a raw, wordless scream of rage and bolted toward the exit. Hey, wait, Clover! Junpei reached out to stop her, but she didn't even seem to notice him. Clover slammed through the door and disappeared out of the room. Damn it. He leaped up and took off after her. At the staircase, Junpei skidded to a halt and looked around. Damn it, I lost her! He took a step toward the stairs, muttering angrily to himself. Then suddenly, Junpei felt a sharp pain in his neck, as if he'd been stabbed by a needle or... He tried to spin around, but his body refused to respond. The attempt at movement was enough to disrupt his balance, however, and he staggered and fell, tumbling down the stairs to a landing. Or rather, into a pool of water several feet deep that had gathered above the landing. He felt his body begin to sink. Straining to keep his head above water, Junpei finally saw her. Clover. She was reaching out for him with her left hand, an eerie smile frozen on her face. Here, take my hand. Clover? What, what did you... Just a little injection. That stuff Ace took. I got some from his pocket. There, there was more? Mm-hmm. Junpei opened his mouth to try and ask why. But there was no point. He already knew. Junpei had left Clover and Lotus and gone through door three. The body in the shower on the other side of that door had been snakes. Clover likely thought Junpei had killed him. It wasn't a difficult jump to make. Or perhaps losing her brother had simply driven her insane. The cold, vacant look in her eyes would have made Junpei shiver if he wasn't already paralyzed and about to die. What are you doing? Hurry up and grab my hand. The injection she'd given him seemed to have worked its way to Junpei's brain. Thinking was becoming increasingly difficult, and everything felt indistinct. He reached out for Clover. You idiot! Why would I help you? The last thing he heard was the soft gurgle of water as his face dropped beneath the surface. As he sank, he could see Clover's face getting further and further away. The water twisted and distorted it into something that barely seemed human. Okay, that's one of the bad ends.